With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. Welcome into the show, and I hope you're having a wonderful beginning to your work week. We're coming off a crazy weekend of sports. If you're a Giants fan, if you're an Ace fan, may have been good, may have been bad. If you're a Kentucky Derby fan, you're watching them horse races go crazy. But I think the two biggest stories of the weekend weren't even really related to sports. In fact, it was the roast of Tom Brady and the Kendrick Lamar and Drake beef. And speaking of beef, we finally have gotten to round number three of the San Francisco 49ers 2024 NFL Draft Class, and we'll be diving in to their third round pick at number 86 of round three, Dominic Pooney, uh, offensive lineman from Kansas. And look, before we even get to the Dominic Pooney pick, one, I have to ask you to please like, share, and subscribe, and hit that bell notification the next time we go live. But also, I firmly believe Dominic Pooney might just be, of this draft class, the most important pick the San Francisco 49ers had in, what, two weeks ago NFL draft, because every Niner fan, whether you were wanting a tackle, whether you're wanting a guard or a center, you were screaming from the high heavens, get Brock Purdy some protection. And they got protection for their franchise quarterback in the third round. So the question is, who exactly is Dominic Pooney? Is he a tackle? Is he a guard? Is he a starter day one? Is he just a backup rotational piece? Who exactly is the newest offensive lineman? And... Keep in mind, not just the newest offensive lineman. He is the third highest drafted offensive lineman under Kyle Shanahan. The first being Mike McGlinchey, the second being Aaron Banks, and the third being Dominic Pooney, which is so funny because the first three picks in this draft follow very similar orders because Ricky Pearsall becomes the second highest drafted receiver under Kyle Shanahan. Renardo Green becomes the highest cornerback drafted by Kyle Shanahan, and, and, and I believe the highest drafted secondary piece since Eric Reed in the Jim Arbaugh era. Now Dominic Pooney becomes the third highest offensive lineman pick. So, um, like I stated for the first two players, the expectation is for Pearsall and Green and Pooney to all be impact players either day one, year one, or in the immediate future if you want to consider year one and year two within uh, that time frame. Uh, Fluffy Ninja, what's going on? He says, hello, Empire. Bobo says, yes, and I hope Pooney becomes an all-time great Niner. Um, I think every Niner fan would love if Dominic Pooney not just became a starter this year, but became a, 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 a cornerstone guard for the next decade in San Francisco, similar to what Mikey Apati was supposed to be or what Joe Staley became at tackle. And now those are high expectations, mind you. But I do think Dominic Pooney, he can at least impact the Niners offensive line. And maybe if all things go to all things go to plan, um, is hopefully stopping Chris Jones in the Super Bowl, which has been San Francisco's biggest problem the past two times they played in that game. And I want to talk about exactly the need at offensive line. Um, Niner fans were just hating the draft through the first two pick. And I understand it again. You know, it wasn't the tackle in the first round. You wanted Cooper DeGene. Second round, it wasn't the tackle. Uh, you traded back in the second round and you watched uh, Rosengarten and Sue Matea go in front of you, allowing Kansas City to move up to take Sue Matea, mind you. But 
Uh, and round three is finally where San Francisco felt comfortable taking an offensive lineman. And even then, even then, it did feel like Niner fans were like, who? Dominic what? Are you sure that's his last name? That's an interesting last name. <laughs> uh, the nicknames, I'm sure, were a plenty for Dominic Pooney, but who is he? Dominic Pooney is a 6'5", 313-pound offensive lineman, a six-year college player, former Division II uh, college player, then transfers to Kansas, which unfortunately this season they beat my Oklahoma Sooners and ruined our playoff bid, but I digress. Um... And he truly is someone that has played everywhere in college. He's played left tackle. He's played left guard. He's played right guard. He's played right tackle. He is someone that has a lot of versatility, which screams San Francisco 49ers, um, and not just with the offensive line. Ricky Pearsall can play inside. He can play outside. Green can play nickel safety and outside. Now Dominic uh, Pooney can play so many different places on the offensive line. But I think... For the Niners, that question is, is he going to be this sixth man rotational piece? Kind of like Daniel Brunskill was, where he can play center, he can play guard, he can play right tackle. While there's nothing wrong with being a Daniel Brunskill, the reality is you probably don't want a third round pick to become that. You want a player like Jared Kingston in the sixth round to become Daniel Brunskill. But Dominic Pooney is someone who I believe is only going to be a guard at the NFL level. He isn't someone you point to and say, yes, he's a tackle. He's someone who you hope can play inside knowing that, whether it's this year and replacing John Feliciano when he's retired in one year or maybe jumping him on the depth chart in year one, uh, becoming the RG2 above Spencer Burford, if they move Burford to tackle, maybe that's an opportunity, um, or in one year's time, letting Aaron Banks walk and replacing him with Dominic Pooney. Um, a lot of options on the table. I could argue of the off of the draft picks we've talked about so far, and maybe even the draft class in totality, um, above Pearsall, who I think can impact this year, maybe even start at times this year. Renardo Green, who I think in a very crowded cornerback room could indeed start in year one. I think Dominic Pooney, I think could be the one player you point to and say, yeah, he can start day one. And the reason why I say that is because San Francisco's unafraid to replace guys who have started. A couple years ago, it was Brunskill, Mike Person was there, McGlinchey's played there, Jonathan or Justin School. Um, it's not like they haven't had a revolving door of starting offensive linemen. Now, you want to lock down somebody, but even take last year, for example. Um, Spencer Burford was the starter. He struggled. They replaced him. I would not be surprised if come, I don't know, November, December, if Feliciano was hurt or he's struggling, them giving Dominic Pooney a chance to go out there and prove his worth. Now, will Kyle Shanahan be comfortable with that? Pooney obviously has to make Shanahan feel comfortable with him doing so, but uh, he is not a, a, a puny human being. He, again, he is 6'5", 313 pounds, six-year college athlete, going again with the continuity of Pearsall being a five-year college player and Green also being a five-year plus college player but Pooney can play everywhere guard tackle again I think he'll be a guard at the NFL level but um there's a reason why I think at least myself can say this for sure that while I did want a Christian Haynes while I'd appointed to a Blake Fisher as the future tackle of this team mainly on the right side um there isn't much to dislike about Dominic Pooney in fact, there really isn't anything to dislike about him other than maybe his anchor. But overall, the way this draft class kind of filtered out was you had your high-end guys, you know, you had your your alts, um, your uh, you know Fontenot's, your uh, more and more guys, your J.C. Latham's, like, and the, and there were clear-cut. You're going to be a guard. You're going to be a tackle, but the backup positions, or you can say the second-tier players, there wasn't clear-cut tackles and guards. Uh, like, Roger Rosengarten probably not going to play year one for the Ravens. San Francisco obviously didn't feel okay with him playing year one for them as well. Kingsley Suomatea, is he a guard or he is a tackle? Um, Christian Haynes, probably a left guard for Seattle, where San Francisco may have said, we need more help at right guard in year one, and 
Christian Haynes maybe isn't the best fit for what we want to do. Um, then Blake Fisher, more so a tackle, but then Patrick Paul, who went to Miami. Not a great run defender, and he's probably going to be a left tackle for them. Uh, Caden Wallace was super overdrafted by the New England Patriots in round number three. Uh, so when it looked like San Francisco kind of found, I don't want to say it was a reach, or did it, to some it kind of was like, well, they did, they they settled. They just found a player, they had to take one, and they picked a guy out of the litter. Um, I don't think I don't think that is the case at all with Dominic Pooney. I think Dominic Pooney is someone that, again, you sit back and you go, hmm, let me try to find, you know, the the weaknesses in his game. And there certainly is some, but he's all around kind of just like a, you do everything relatively well. Um, 25 straight starts and nearly 1,600 snaps at Kansas didn't allow a single sack. Like, crazy. <laughs> and that's just in pass protection where... He isn't going to overcommit on his blocks. He's not going to, you know, reach. Granted, because his arms are relatively small for a tackle, you move him inside. Um, that's only going to help him even more, keeping blocks in front of him with his smaller arm length or shorter arm length. Um, he's not going to have to reach. He's not going to have to be quick towards the edge and get back in his stance. And he's going to have some protection at the right tackle position and at center with Jake Brendel still there. Um, but he's very calm. And I think... Dominic Pooney and Renardo Green are two players that, you know, they're not going to get overwhelmed. Now, they're going to get beat. That's the NFL. That's life in the NFL. You're going to get beat by better players. But watching Dominic Pooney, reading up on Dominic Pooney, uh, you can tell there is this calmness he brings where he's not going to over-pursue. Or again, he's not going to reach. Um, but he also isn't a player going to get, you know, he's not going to stare down you know, insert, you know, defensive tackle if it was last year Aaron Donald, like, holy crap, what do I do now? He'll probably get beat. Most people do. But he's not going to be scared, not going to, you know, he's not going to go, oh, the lights are too bright for me. He's not going to be a Mike Person come the Super Bowl. He's going to be a guard you can put out there and go, okay, like, I may not be the biggest guy. I may not be the strongest player, but I can hold my own and I'm going to learn and grow. He's, in high, he's a high IQ player. He knows where to be. He can pick up stunts pretty well. Um, he's not someone that is going to get rattled play after play after play and let things spiral. He will fight his way back. And, you know, one bad play isn't going to just ruin his entire performance week to week. Bad play, shake it, move on, go back out there and hopefully hold your own against a, a star defensive tackle. Byron Murphy's with Seattle now. Lock him up if you have to, you know. So he's someone that... Now, he only allowed four pressures in two seasons. <laughs> so, he played 25 straight games in college. 1,600 snaps, no sacks allowed, and through two seasons, he didn't he didn't allow more than five pressures. That's incredible. Um, this year alone, he didn't allow a single sack or quarterback hit on 324 pass blocking snaps. So, um, again... He isn't the greatest pass blocker, but and there might be some questions of, you know, look at the defenses you're going up against. Uh, you're playing against the Oklahomas, who aren't a great defense. Although, boomer sooner, baby. Um, shout out Brett Venables. I mean, you're playing teams like Texas that has, you know, your Tavondre Sweats and, you know, your Byron Murphys. Like, yes, there are impressive outings, but you're also in, what is it, Big 12, Big 10 now, whatever it is in college. Everything is all jacked up. Like, you're not playing the best defenses every single week. Or you're not in the SEC or the ACC. You're in the Big 12. Um, so, it's not like you're playing against Jared Verse and Braden Fisk and Johnny Newton. You're not playing the top-tier guys week in, week out. But it's still super impressive to where you can say, that's not just, like, we're not able to just work with that. We can plug you in here and, you know, you're not going to be, like, you're not going to fall apart Whereas the past offensive linemen San Francisco have taken, if I can think back that far, like Nick Zakel, Spencer Burford, albeit Burford was better in his rookie season and has really struggled the past few seasons, hasn't taken that next step. Dominic Pooney may already be better than Spencer Burford in day one. Like I, I think that's a real conversation you can have of he can be your instant sixth man with starting potential. Now, will he be special? Time will tell. Um, there are certainly good pass blocking traits to like and production. It's not just 
He's an athlete. He's this big 6'6", 320-pound tackle, but he's super raw. Like, that was a big complaint I got when we mocked Marius Mims and traded up for him in one of our mock drafts. Everyone was saying, he's green, he's too young, only eight games last year. And it's like, okay, you're getting the exact opposite with that with Dominic Pooney. Now, mind you, Marius Mims, 18th overall pick, way higher upside. Dominic Pooney, third round pick. He's not going to be a you know this amazing blue chip prospect, but he can bring... Um, you know, some some comfort of like if one of our guys goes down, mainly being Banks or Feliciano, we're not gonna be in complete panic mode. Whereas last year in the Super Bowl, the minute Feliciano went down, it was like, oh my god, Spencer Burford's out there. And I and I like Spencer, but just it might be better <laughs> if he wasn't on the field in the Super Bowl for you now. I think Dominic Pooney slides in as your backup right guard and left guard um, if it, you know if things go you know great for him. Um, again, doesn't have the arm length. He'll be a guard. I know John Lynch was like, well, he can play tackle. Please don't do that. I'd rather Burford play tackle. Like if if they walked into this year, and for whatever reason, I don't I don't understand this. Um, John Lynch and Kyle Shanahan in their post draft press con post-draft press conference, excuse me, had said that we like Jalen Moore. He's a good backup. And it's like, yeah, he's, he's, he's fine. Like, I don't think anyone has ever praised Jalen Moore before, to be honest with you. Now, he wasn't bad this past year filling in for Trent Williams. And I think he's a young player. There's building blocks to grow. But Jalen Moore has probably already reached his ceiling as a player which is probably a backup left guard, maybe the fourth tackle on your team. And, you know, I think we all saw in the last couple of years when Trent went down or in previous years when McGlinchey got hurt. You know, you had McKivitz, who you were more comfortable with being that third swing tackle for you on the roster. Um, I would much rather have or go into a you know, training camp in OTAs a season with Jalen Moore, and Spencer Burford as my my backup tackles because they just signed someone and I'm forgetting his name. Um, he played for the Raiders the past few years. Horrible, horrible player. I don't know why he's here. Obviously, he has some some Mick Lombardi carryover from the Vegas Raiders, but like just yikes. And even last year, Matt Pryor being this team's backup right tackle, it was like I'm not expecting the fourth tackle on a team to be good. Nobody should, but holy, <laughs> like. Every rep he's getting beat by third string edge rushers, and if McKivitz or Trent goes down, he's the next man on deck. Like, this is not good. You move Burford over to tackle on the off chance Pooney has to play tackle, but you move Burford over, it certainly makes you more comfortable. And if all things go well, you have Feliciano as your backup guard center tackle, have him be that, you know, Daniel Brunskill role, and you are extremely deep on the offensive line, whereas last year, if one cog in that machine goes down, we're all sitting there saying, DEFCON 1, DEFCON 1, hit the panic button, holy crap! Like, the season might be over, this year is much different. If Pooney can become the player, I think he will, and we haven't even got into why I believe Kyle Shanahan fell in love with him. Now, um, we've talked about his fit, he'll be a guard, not a tackle, in my opinion. You know, the pass protection is pretty good. Um, let's talk about the, you know, the, the downside is how I'll phrase it. The downside of Dominic Pooney. Um, again, the arm length isn't there. Um, he is someone that really needs to improve his lower half. Um, I think if he's playing against a player like, I don't know, I'm trying to think of, you know, star defensive tackles. Christian Wilkins, for example. Chris Jones, for example. Um, he does need to improve the lower half because he has a tough time absorbing an anchor. And while it's not a problem in college, sometimes you can kind of get by with it. Um, you're playing in the NFL now, and I do think that that will come back to bite him. So, needs to improve his lower half, and, and that's not uncommon with mid-round, late-round uh, offensive linemen where they're not the most refined players, albeit Pooney is much more refined than most coming out. Um, I do think that he has some, you know, some physical traits he has to improve. The technique isn't bad, which is a great thing to hear. A lot of time it's, you know, 
he was bad anchor, he's bad arm length, and you have to improve his technique. No, Dominic Pooney can come in and like the technique is relatively, you know, well rounded. Whereas his issues are, you know, you need to improve uh, your anchor, you need to improve, you know, some of your footwork, but that I don't think that's going to be an overall issue with him. Um in regards to his technique, again, it's overall well rounded, but you'd like to see an improvement of the the hand placement, some quicker footwork here and there again. But I think a lot of that, mainly the footwork and the anchor, are kind of tied to him as a as as an athlete. He isn't the best athlete in the world, um, which what do you expect in the middle rounds? Now that can be a knock saying Kyle Lynch. That's why you pick a Christian Haynes. That's why you pick a a Blake Fisher. That's why you reach for a player if you need to. But um, I think now is a good time to get into why Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch fell in love with Dominic Pooney because there are a few traits that every Kyle Shanahan offensive lineman seemingly need to have (laughs) in uh, in the past few years. And that is quick shuttle time and a very fast three-cone drill. And Dominic Pooney was, I believe he was of the six offensive linemen that had the fastest three cone and shuttle time San Francisco took two of them so uh that one of them being Dominic Pooney and the other one being Jarrett Kingston later in the draft but Dominic Pooney 4.4 shuttle time and a 7.473 cone so again he isn't the best athlete but he has relatively quick feet he's good off the offensive line he's pretty explosive he's not perfect um I don't think he's gonna be this all around like wow did you see Trent Williams crush you know, Buda Baker or the Cardinals uh, defensive player. It's like Dominic Pooney is going to come in, do his job, not get many flowers for it, but he's likely not going to be this massive detriment. You know, he'll be a fine insert player, which is kind of what you want, right? Now, well, I'll rephrase that. It's what you want in the middle rounds. <laughs> because, you know, first, second round picks, those guys are supposed to be day one starters, come in, change how the offensive line looks, be a dog day one. And while I do think Dominic Pooney has some of those traits in him, he ain't the best athlete. He ain't the quickest guy. He has quick feet, but he ain't the quickest guy. He's not a physical specimen. He's not your your Christian Hange. He isn't your Zach Zinters. He's not your Zach Frazier's or your Jackson Power Johnson's. Um, he might not even be a Bo Limmer, right? But he's a player that you point to and say, Okay, like, you're not going to be the reason we lose games, whereas Spencer Burford, at times last year, Aaron Banks, albeit he was better than most people think he was, Um, even Colton McKivitz at times. Now, you're playing against the best edge rusher on each person's team because you don't want to face Trent. You're going to get beat. Pooney will get beat, but I don't think there's that fear of if, like, if he has to play in a pinch, you know, we're going to get killed, right? Um... I do think that Dominic Pooney, speaking about, you know, shuttle times and three cone drills, that's what brings you to the run game. And I think of all traits an offensive lineman has to have for Kyle Shanahan, knowing they've kind of gotten away from the wide zone, it's still there, but it's a little different. Um, They've kind of morphed into more of a, I don't want to say inside zone, but it's more of like a heavy scheme between the tackles and not so much running towards the outside, which they still do, but it's not as much as it once was. They have definitely transitioned from that and kind of gone back into an old style of football. But um, the good thing about Dominic Pooney is that shuttle time, quick feed, great three cr- great three cone drill. Um, the, Kansas, the, the Kansas Jayhawks loved running behind him. They relied on Dominic Pooney to create many of the holes for their running backs and when I read you this stat you're gonna say yep I get it that's why Kyle said yes that is why they said "Mm mm-hmm that guy are gonna be one of our guards in the next you know next 10 years forever how long he plays because the Kansas Jayhawks ran behind Dominic Pooney 47 percent of the time and in fact 47 percent more than any other interior offensive lineman in this class. Over players like Chris Haynes, Jackson Powers Johnson, Bo Limmer, 
Um, like of any interior offensive lineman in this draft class, Kansas ran behind him nearly 50% more. <laughs> Talk about, you're the guy we got, man. You're the only guy we got. Run behind him. He's going to be a consistent hole maker and open up space for our running backs, which just screams Kyle Shanahan. And also, makes you kind of get a little excited for what he can do for Christian McCaffrey, Elijah Mitchell, maybe even Isaac Garendo, if all things go well. But... On top of that, on top of the near 50% more than any other offensive lineman on the interior in this class, the Kansas Jayhawks averaged three and a half yards before contact, which tops every interior offensive lineman in this class. So, I know it probably wasn't the guy you wanted, it wasn't the guy I wanted, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you, it's like when I saw Dominic Pooney, I said, okay. Cool. I guess that makes sense. <laughs> you know, why didn't you pick X, Y, and Z? I'm still going to say Seattle getting Christian Haynes would have been my pick um, in the second round. But um, I do think that, you know, Bobo in the, the comments, and this is a great point, which I think I can push back on, Aaron Banks didn't play his rookie year either. Well, that's the difference with Dominic Pooney. The reason why Aaron Banks didn't play his rookie season was because they had Lakin Tomlinson playing left guard. They wanted to make Banks the right guard, and he couldn't get his body right. The footwork wasn't there. Whereas Dominic Pooney has played left guard, he has played right guard, and he has played tackle. He has experience at three different positions. And I do think, you know, if he has to play left guard, it's not going to be, can he do it? It'll be, yes, he can do it. You know, if someone gets hurt and he has to play right guard, it's not going to be, can he transition over there? It's like, yes, like he's perfectly fine doing that, um, which I do think makes him more of an instant impact player than Banks was, or I think he played one game against Jacksonville in Jacksonville in 2019. So I don't think that's going to be an issue. Uh, and it's not like he was a second round pick who doesn't play. So there isn't as much pressure on him, but I will say this. The reason why I asked the question, was Dominic Pooney the most important pick of this last draft class, was simply because of anybody. Renardo Green, Ricky Pearsall, Jared Kingston, you know, Malik Mustafa, Isaac Grendo. This was San Francisco's biggest need. And, you know, when you look at what this team needed to address, offensive line was likely towards the top for a lot of people. And I won't say I wasn't in that crowd. I would have loved Jordan Morgan. I would have loved Christian Haynes. I would have loved Blake Fisher to fill out this room to improve right tackle or guard. But people were screaming. Offensive line. Every single pick until it happened. And even then, people were like, Dominic Pooney, that's not who I liked. When Dominic Pooney may be one of the more... Not just because of the situation he's coming into, probably going to be your sixth man day one, but I think if push comes to shove and he has to play, I think he could. And I think that he could actually push to play day one, probably even more so than Pearsall could because the receiver room is so stacked. You have three guys already. Renardo Green could be a player that they want to have him sit down for, you know, half a year and, and learn. Whereas Dominic Pooney probably comes in and he's better than Burford. He's not going to play center, so that probably takes out Ben Barge and Nick Zakel, and you know he can walk in, and I wouldn't be surprised if he unseats Feliciano if all things go well. Now that's a high projection, but it's not like they have all pro all pro guards. <laughs> they have fine guards, and they are arguably a backup guard away from winning the Super Bowl. So that's why I call this the most important draft pick because. You know, let's say you're in the exact same position you were last year. And it's like, Feliciano goes down. Dominic Pooney has to come in. I can guarantee you, myself and you and Shanahan's probably a lot more comfortable with Pooney out there than Burford. And that's no knock on Spencer. Like, Pooney's going to have to learn the system, the playbook. There are things as a rookie you're going to have to learn in Shanahan's offense. And those things are tough, but... You know, the reason why I said this may be the most important draft pick of the of the class as a whole was simply because this team was one guard away from winning the whole thing last year. And, you know, I don't think they're ex 
their expectation isn't Pooney to just be a sixth offensive lineman. They want him to start. But I do think it's about shoring up and, you know, everyone talked about when they brought back Jimmy G a couple years ago. They had Lance and Jimmy and they had Purdy. They're insulated. I think this fills kind of that role where, okay, look, could Pooney start? Yeah, maybe. But he at least gives us a higher floor where if things go wrong and things turn bad and they get ugly and guys get hurt and they break legs and they get turf to whatever it might be and he has to play, he's if he's not allowed a sack and 1,600 plus snaps in college, he's allowed 14 quarterback hits in two seasons or 14 quarterback pressures in two seasons. He's a guy who Kansas relied on nearly 50% more than any other interior offensive lineman in this class to run behind. Like, this guy is all reliable in college, and the NFL isn't the college football world. We know that, but if you're all reliable in college, why can't you be at least semi-reliable in the NFL in year one? Now, yes, he has to get stronger. Yes, you want him to improve the footwork, and yes, you want the hands to be more consistent. That's what's called getting coaching. But... If you plucked a guy out of college and say, you got to start day one outside of the you know the first round guys, I can argue Dominic Pooney may start over guys taken in the second round. And I think while it wasn't a tackle, I can almost guarantee you, unless the Ravens are dumb or Roger Rosengarten just all of a sudden bulks up out of his mind or Patrick Paul from Houston now with the Dolphins has to play, Dominic Pooney, I think, will be much more successful than those two players who were picked ahead of him. And so, you know, I don't want fans to, you know, say, oh, you know, he's going to be an all-world, all-class guard. He may not be. But I think on day one, he can start over players drafted ahead of him. And I think the way the last couple years have gone for the Niners, it's not the starters having issues. It's been not having backups that have caused problems. Two years ago, Purdy gets hurt. Then Josh Johnson gets hurt. Obviously, that same year, Jimmy G and Trey Lance got hurt. It was like, holy crap, three starters get hurt, and we don't have anybody else. Now, that's unprecedented. But then last year, Burford gets hurt and doesn't do his job. Or Feliciano gets hurt and Burford doesn't do his job. So, um, it's not like it's been the starting players, which there have been some, but as a whole starting players being the main issues. It's like, our starter gets hurt and our backup isn't good enough in the playoffs. Um, which isn't always to be expected, but now you have Pooney. Such a weird name to say. <laughs> it's just such a, such a weird name to say over and over and over again. But you have Dominic Poon, who I think could, you know, if, if someone goes down, if he plays better than them, could play day one. I don't think he will. And I think that's what kind of angers Niner fans of like, you're bringing back the same offensive line you had last year? Arr, I'm angry! But it's like, technically no. Because now, and I'm forgetting his name, the guy they picked up from the Raiders, but then you have Dominic Pooney behind them. And you have Ben Barch, who was off an injury that happened in 2022. He's fully healthy again. Who San Francisco, I wouldn't be surprised, makes him their backup center, if not the center of the future, once Brendel's contract's up, but um, I do think they have strengthened the depth. And as we've seen, depth on the offensive line and other positions have been this team's kind of downfall, hence why I think Dominic Pooney is the most important draft pick of the 2024 draft class. Like, go back to what Jim Harbaugh said when he got the Chargers job leading into the draft. We're going to use the offensive line as a weapon. Now, Kyle Shanahan's not doing that. He isn't going to bulk up everywhere and get drafted five offensive linemen, albeit some of you might wish he would. But Dominic Pooney is a player that, you know, in the vein of that comment of like, we need to make sure we're insulated here and be able to use the offensive line. And, you know, again, Jim Harbaugh is a different animal and beast, but... Harbaugh knew, I have to keep Justin Herbert upright. He has two cornerstone tackles now if Joel hits, which he should. Now San Francisco, albeit not like Jim Harbaugh exactly, but they do have some insulation where, hey, if, if someone goes down, we're going to keep Purdy upright, who is a pretty good pass protector in, in Dominic Pooney, and also a guy who he's not going to go in there being like, I'm a one-trick pony as an offensive lineman, 
I'm a real, like, take Mike McGlinchey. McGlinchey was a really bad pass blocker. Phenomenal run blocker. He'd get out on, on runs. He'd get the corner. He'd be the lead guy. And you're like, yes, that's Mike McGlinchey. Now, pass pro, he's getting pushed back and twisted and turned sideways. And you're like, Mike, just hold the block for a second, brother, please. Um, and I do think that Dominic Pooney on the interior at guard, not tackle, uh, does give San Francisco the ability to walk into the year saying, okay, like we, we aren't perfect, but we didn't have to be perfect to win the whole thing last year. We just needed the backup guard to be better. And I think Pooney gives San Francisco just that. He's not going to be perfect. He's not this hyper-athletic guard to get out on runs and just blow up people like Trent Williams might. He's not going to play tackle. At least he shouldn't play tackle. But I do think he he strengthens you as a whole. Which, when you do that, it allows you to put other people in the right places and strengthen the offensive line altogether. And I think for a player like Dominic Pooney, who was picked in round three and... At pick 86, right, who San Francisco traded up with the Eagles to get, mind you, um, I do think he's a good pick for the Niners. If I was going to give him a grade, which I gave Pearsall a grade and I gave um, Bernardo Green a, a grade, I will give Dominic Pooney of the San Francisco 49ers round three, pick 86, if my phone loads, which is always hard, <laughs> I will give him a draft grade, again, if my phone loads, a B. A solid B. I think that's just as simple as it gets. They didn't overdraft him. They didn't underdraft him. He wasn't a reach. He wasn't this amazing steal. It was like a, yep, that's a good pick. He fills a need. He'll fill a void in one, two years' time. And maybe if all things go perfectly, he starts day one, kind of like Pierre Saul and Green do. But, um... And I think this year for the Niners, it wasn't really about finding the right tackle of the future. You know, we talked about in the pre-draft process, do you want to get a tackle that plays right tackle now and you make McKivich your swing tackle and in two years' time, they flop, Trent Williams says goodbye, and then you're, the guy you draft goes and plays left tackle and becomes your cornerstone guy to block Brock Purdy's backside or blindside. Um, I didn't buy into that. Now, I was cool with getting a tackle. Mary Smims, Jordan Morgan... I was cool with that. Like, that's position of need for you, but I don't think McKivitz is that bad. I don't think he's great. I would... I think anybody, including Kyle Shanahan himself, would say, I'm cool with replacing that guy. <laughs> um, but I just think the way the draft fell, the way they moved back, they didn't trust nobody. And I think, like, they didn't trust Kingsley Sulamatea. Did the Ravens take Roger Rosengarden ahead of them? And they were like, oh, darn, maybe. But I do think that they didn't just take Dominic Pooney. They made it a point to trade up for him in the third round. So I do think that San Francisco values what he brings to the table. They realize that he can play day one in a pinch if needed. And I think the hope would be if we get into a big moment and someone goes down, he might save the day. Or he'll be good enough where you're not even going to mention his name. <laughs> Which I think... For an offensive lineman, that's kind of what you want when no one's talking about you. Hey, that's two thumbs up, buddy. Hey, the worst thing about being a Niner fan the past few years, we've talked a lot about McKivitz, a lot about McGlinchey, a lot about Burford and Brunskill, and others where it's like, oh man, if you guys can just stay upright and stay healthy, my God. Dominic Pooney, I think, does kind of, well, what about me? Like, I think he slides in. He can, like, <laughs> if you've watched This Is The End with James Franco and Seth Rogen and, and, and or Jay Burrisha, whatever his name is, you've seen the meme where they're duct taping the giant cracks in the in the wall and you're like, that's not going to fix anything. Like, the crack is still there. And, like, obviously it's, it's, it's a bit, but that's what it has felt like the past few years. They're just duct taping these giant cracks and walls on the offensive line and you're like, no, like, you need to fill that hole. Like, there's still a giant crack there. Like, you may have four of your five, you know, your starters filled, but that fifth guy is horrible. And I think now, with Pooney uh, on the roster, it's like, okay, they're starting to fill that crack in with some, you know, with some glue or, you know, with some caulk, whatever it is you have to put in walls. I don't do any of that stuff. But, you know what I'm trying to say? You are filling a need with, 
a much more fitting material than duct tape. Because <laughs> the past few years have not been pretty uh, on the offensive line. You got Trent, you love him. Banks is okay. He's fine. He's probably a mid-level starting guard. That's fine. Brendel's been okay for what he's supposed to be. He was an all-pro two years ago, so I'm not too worried about him. And he's a vet. Shanahan wants a vet. Yeah, Feliciano, also a vet. They're not tied to him. If, if, if Pooney plays well, Feliciano will go to the bench, which is probably better for you, to be honest. And then McKivitz is your starting right tackle. Is it perfect? No. Do you want better? Yes. Um, over time, I can guarantee you, in a couple years, Banks will be gone and Trent will be gone after he retires, and we're going to be sitting here asking for, you know, where's the left tackle? Where's the left guard? And we're going to be screaming out more things. But I think in 2024, um, that giant crack that was like Spencer Burford and Ben Barch and Nick Zakellis, you can put in Dominic Pooney in the, the, the infrastructure is a lot stronger than it was than before the draft. And I do think Niner fans should at least be happy in that. Now, we have a question in the comments. And it's not Dominic Pooney related. So if you have any questions, I will answer those now. But we do have one question in the comments. And it's by Bobo, who's always here. Um, Bobo says, Tom Brady mentioned that he will come back if a starting quarterback goes down in the midst of a serious playoff run. Do you see the Niners being one of those teams? Now look, I know there was, a, I, I, forgetting his name, but there was a Boston reporter or radio guy on 95.7 The Game, my current employer, and he was like, whether Purdy's healthy or not, go call Tom Brady. Now, that's asinine, but if the Niners, let's say, got to December, let's say got near the trade deadline, and or no, week, week 10 or 12, whatever it is, and Purdy goes down and he's not going to come back for three months and it's like he may come back for the playoffs but it's up in the air and you're not sure i don't think anybody would be okay with joshua dobbs and i like him a lot he's the pastronaut for a reason right or brandon allen or even tanner mordecai no one's going to be happy with those guys unless they just blow us away would i then make a call for tom brady why not? <laughs> um, now that said, it would depend on what he wants. I know him and Kyle have had this weird, like strenuous relationship where it's like, oh, Tom wants to come here. And Kyle's like, nope, we got Jimmy G. Then Tom wins and Kyle's like, I should have taken Tom. Crap, I still have Jimmy G. And then the Niners, I think, called Tom last year because Purdy wasn't exactly healthy yet. No TAs in training camp. And they were like, okay. Like, we're going to call Tom, and Tom was like, you can F off. And so, I don't know if that would even be a marriage worth... Marriage and Tom Brady probably isn't the right connection or word to use. But, but I don't think that would be... The relationship probably wouldn't be best. Like, would Tom Brady walk in and just do what Kyle Shanahan wants him to do? It doesn't feel like Tom... And Tom's like mid forties. Now I'm not saying he can't still play, but if you're worried about the offensive line now with Brock Purdy, who can move a little bit, are you not gonna be worried about the offensive line with a forty five year old Tom Brady out there taking hits because the offensive line's not doing their job? Like, I mean I I trust Tom. Tom's won what eight Super Bowls, seven Super Bowls, whatever it is. Like, he's the greatest quarterback of all time or at least in the past 25 plus years, like, he's incredible. Like, you add the GOAT, or one of the GOATs, whatever you want to say, to this team, everyone's going to say, watch out for San Francisco, but it's going to scream, like, to me it would scream, like, when the Colts signed Phillip Rivers, and you're like, wow! Then you're like, yeah, but they're going to lose gas, because he's exhausted. Like, takes a couple hits, it's like, yeah, he's 40. <laughs> he's not going to last very long. Um, now, Tom takes care of his body really well, but... I don't, and really, I don't even think the questions about Tom would be Tom's body. It would be, do him and Kyle get along? <laughs> and I don't think they would. Like, <laughs> Kyle is such a hard person to get along with when you're a quarterback. It's taken, you know, Jimmy G and taken, you know, <laughs> and it's taken, 
you know, Jimmy G and Trey Lance and now Brock Purdy to finally, you know, have this cohesion between quarterbacks. Now, Jimmy G's his own beast, and we, we can talk about him later, but it's not like Kyle and Matt Ryan, of all people, didn't butt heads. Like, Matt Ryan was already an established top 10 quarterback when Kyle got there, and Kyle was like, we don't like each other. <laughs> it's like, what is going on? So, I don't know if it's because Kyle has so much respect for Tom or they can get along, but I do think the bigger question, like, I don't think Kyle would be against it. I just think that would have to be like, this is my team. You know, this is my offense. Does you just insert Tom and he's okay with it? Now, I, I think Tom would flourish in the offense, especially if Debo's healthy for sure. But, man, like, I just. I just have a. I've never been one to believe Tom Brady was ever going to play for the 49ers, even after New England said, you're out of here, right? Even after things got bad with Belichick out there in Foxborough, I was like, I was never, bring Tom to San Francisco! Until we got Trey Lance and Jimmy G was, you know, supposed to be gone. I was like, yeah, bring in Tom. That makes sense um, for a year or two. But even then, like, I know Mike Florio loves to just toss out the Tom Brady conversation. I'm kind of over it. Like, I get it, Bobo. You're asking me if Brady goes down. I, I don't, I don't think so. I think, while they're not tied to Joshua Dobbs, and even last year in Minnesota, traded for Dobbs and benched him for Nick Mullins, which, yikes. Um, I just think that not only is Tom going to want to go to a place that he can win, which could be San Francisco. I just think, <laughs> like, I would be shocked if Tom Brady signed here, but I wouldn't be shocked if Stafford went down and he went to the Rams or went to Green Bay, or went to the Dolphins. And I'm pretty sure Tom couldn't play for a team while he owns the Raiders. I think that would be a conflict of interest. Now, maybe that's okay. You can own a different team and play for one, but um, that may also be a problem for the NFL. Of like, You can't own a team and also play in the same league. But I do think that could be a concern. But I don't think Tom will ever be a Niner. And if he does... What the heck? <laughs> What's going on, man? And honestly, if he does, things have gone horribly wrong. I think to a point of Purdy and Joshua Dobbs have gotten hurt. But I don't think Tom Brady's ever going to be a Niner. Um, albeit it would be interesting. But that's also a conversation of like, what are we talking about? Like, we're talking about Tom Brady a year after Brock Purdy nearly won an MVP. And I'm not targeting you, Bobo. I'm talking about guys in on the radio like this team should sign tom brady you know how disrespectful that is to brock purdy like my god like we're supposed to be out here talking about dominic pooney 86 overall pick third rounder by the san francisco 49ers and his scheme fit if he'll play and why shanahan fell in love with him and now we're talking about tom brady and brock purdy i'd rather have tom brady over brock purdy right now and it's like Purdy almost won the freaking MVP. <laughs> what are we talking about? It's so disrespectful. Like, that would be like, you're married to somebody, and you divorce them, and you marry somebody else, and you're like, this is great. We had an awesome honeymoon. We're two years in. It's perfect. We love each other so much. And then you're like, yeah, but I kind of still like the other guy. Kind of still love my previous husband or wife. And it's like, you can't do that. Like, that's disrespectful to who you're currently with. <laughs> it's like what? Well, it's like people that have a boyfriend, then cheat on their boyfriend with their previous boyfriend. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, if, why'd you why'd you leave that guy if you're gonna cheat on the new guy with the other guy? <laughs> Just stay with the other dude. What's going on? <laughs> Welcome to Doctor Phil. If you just tuned in. <laughs> Welcome to Maury. You are the father. But like, man. Like, it's just like, what, why? Like, ugh. that would be like Kyle Shanahan trying to sign Jimmy Garoppolo back this offseason, even though he has Brock Purdy. What are you doing? Don't, don't do that. And Kyle never would because he hates Jimmy G, but like, what are you doing? Like, no, you don't do that thing. But, reverse everything back and move back to the Dominic Pooney conversation. 
whether it is Brock Purdy, whether it is Tom Brady, off on a tangent there for a second, which, by the way, go watch The Roast. It was really, really good at Tom Brady on Netflix. Um, a lot of great jokes on there. <laughs> Crazy out-of-pocket things were said. Uh, that that said, uh, Dominic Pooney, I don't know if he'll start day one. I don't know if he'll be a 10-year player in the pros, but I can tell you this. The idea, and if Pooney can take what he did at Kansas and translate that to the NFL level at just three quarters or seven eighths of what he was at college, mainly in pass protection, I think San Francisco has found themselves a starting guard. Obviously, things have to go right. Obviously, it's to learn the offense. He's a rookie. I will never try to put insane expectations on a young player. That's what a lot of fans got in trouble with Trey Lance. Oh, he'll be the next Randolph and Dante Culpepper and Donovan McNabb and he RG3 and John Allen. And it was like, holy crap. Like, you're putting MVP expectations on a kid who's 21 playing Division II college football against South Dakota State. It's not how that works. <laughs> it takes time and... Now Trey's in Dallas and didn't even get his fifth-year option picked up, which isn't Trey's fault, but that's life in the NFL. I hope he succeeds. Dominic Pooney, who was traded up for, just not three first-round draft picks, by the way, um, I think he's a player San Francisco believes can fill in, can strengthen the floor of this roster, and I do think that they believe in a year, maybe even week 10 or 12, kind of like Feliciano last year for Burford, would just slide it and start next to Brendel and the Kibitz. Um, I don't see him as a tackle. I don't care what John Lynch says. I don't care. Like, he's not a tackle, John. <laughs> now, to give them their flowers, to, 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 to kind of feed into that, it's Kyle Shanahan, man. He just, if you can run the three cone and the shuttle well, he says, you can play wherever you want. <laughs> and I think he's never kind of had a you have to check these physical boxes of arm length and height and, and weight. And obviously you like people to be heavier and even Pooney has to get stronger in his lower half to absorb, you know, these powerful interior defensive tackles and linemen. Um, I don't think Shanahan would be afraid to play him at tackle, which I wouldn't love that, but I'm not Kyle Shanahan. If I was Kyle Shanahan, I would have drafted Christian Haynes, <laughs> which... Tells you what I think of Kyle, which I love Kyle. It's so hard for anyone, myself, other journalists, other content creators, to question Kyle Shanahan, because who am I? I'm not in that room. I haven't mastered the offense. I mean, I'll be blunt with you as can be. I believe they were going to draft Trey Lance. I believed in what Trey Lance could become. And while things haven't gone that way, you also have to put the... You can say they can be, though the the projection is X, Y, and Z, amazing talent, but you have to put in the work to get there. And I think for Kyle, while I have been relatively in tune, I'm, I'm to pat myself on the back, I thought they were going to pick Trey Lance and Danny Gray, and I had Pearsall and Grendo of players I believed they were going to take. Now, two of those guys have not been very good. <laughs> and two of those guys could be off the roster come this year. But there are there is a type Kyle Shanahan has that's pretty easy to point out when it comes to quarterbacks and weaponry in regards to running backs and receivers. But um, I think you know we can sit here all day and say this guy stinks and that guy sucks and this that and the other. I I wrote off Brock Purdy as the fourth quarterback in the room that had Jimmy G as a backup and Trey Lance as a starter. It was like that guy will never do anything, and, and it wasn't because I didn't think he was good. It was like you know. He's a UDFA, and Brock Purdy, I didn't think he sucked. It was just like, he, he he's a backup quarterback. Blew everybody away. He was awesome. Love Brock Purdy. He'll get $50 million in one year's time, and it'll be awesome. All that is to say that you have to put in the work. Purdy put in the work. He came out there, and he played four-plus years at college off an injury and grinded, took risks, took tangents, got his body right, got hurt, then did it all again. This past year, and darn near almost won the MVP. That same thing goes for Pearsall and Green and, and, and Pooney so far in this draft class. You gotta put in the work. I can think you're gonna be this, that, and the other, and 
I can say where you fit and where you don't fit. If Dominic Pooney puts in the work and gets his anchor right, he can be an awesome guard for this team. He already has shown the the production to be a great pass protector, or at least a good one in college, against not the best you know, talent, but still pretty good. It's college in the Big 12. They aren't scrubs. They're just not SEC uh, defensive players. But even on the run, even in the, the running game, they relied on him for a reason. He created you know holes and space and gaps for their running backs to run through. And I watched them firsthand, not knowing who he was, and watched them run all over Oklahoma. And they were like, wow, that sucks. He just gashed <laughs> my Sooners defense. And so they got to put in the work. Pearsall, Green, the entire draft class, Dominic Pooney, put in the work, you'll get rewarded. And I think for a player like Pooney, um, the reward of starting is not as far as a player like Green, as a player like Pearsall in a really stack receiver room. And and I'm someone who believes Pearsall will have an impact on day one in some form or fashion. And I think at that point this year, he he will play and start a game as a receiver. But I think Dominic Pooney is like one inch away from starting. You come into camp and you probably already have Burford beat, but you beat Feliciano, you're a starter. Like, he's right there, like, on the, the glass ceiling, knocking, like, I'm right here, buddy. And I think Pooney can do it. And, and I, I do believe of the draft picks this year, he is probably, you know, I won't say guaranteed, but he's at least, you know, in a really good spot, in a good position to start over others. I think him and Malik Mustafa are kind of in that position of, like, those two guys that are, like, you know, both you could start, and I can see why on day one. Um, now, having an impact and starting on day one are very different, mind you. I don't think Pearsall starts day one. I don't. Green could start day one, but that's more of a preference thing to me. Um, you probably want to play Isaac Gaten over him on day one. He's a rookie. He's green, stacked cornerback room. But Dominic Pooney is not in a stacked offensive lineman room. It's like a bunch of guys that are either unproven, off injuries, or just not good. I think Dominic Pooney could be the sixth guy, then start, you know, week four or five if all things go well for him. Uh, That's all I have for you today. Thank you for tuning in. You've watched me dive into Pearsall, Bernardo Green, and now Dominic Pooney. Stay tuned later this week. We're going to dive into Malik Mustafa. And I'll tease you with this. Was my favorite pick of the entire Niners draft class. Didn't expect it but was my favorite pick of the entire draft class. I can't wait to gush about Malik Mustafa. And I promise I'm not going to tell you that all of these players are going to be good. I'm going to be honest with you. Some of these guys have deficiencies, and we'll get to some of those guys soon, but I will gush about Malik Mustafa later this week. And I do think him and Dominic Pooney are like 1A, 1B of guys that could start probably be a good starter on day one for this team thank you guys for watching listening i want to kindly ask you to like share subscribe leave that review comment down below your thoughts on the dominic pooney pick we are on the road to 1000 subscribers we're so close so close if we can get there before the next two weeks before i get married on may 31st let's get to 1000 subscribers wouldn't that be a great wedding gift to me and my fiance 1000 subscribers before may 31st tell your friends tell your family to subscribe to this the show and don't forget to follow us on social media at 49ers underscore access is the x or twitter 49ers dot access is the instagram and you can use our promo code 49ers access 49 ers access at seatgeek.com and save yourself $20 off your first purchase. As always, my name is Sterling Bennett, and stay faithful.